Now I'm going to ask Ken Roth to come to the podium, our third honorary degree recipient and here in person to give the commencement address to receive your honorary degree. You, Ken Roth, have also been shaped by the influence of family to become someone who speaks out where there is silence. Your own father fostered your lifelong commitment to the upholding of human rights by telling stories to his four children about the Nazi Germany he fled a few decades before. To you, his eldest son, he spoke of the evil of which governments are capable. You have in your turn devoted your life to watching, or better yet, witnessing, the work of governments which you passionately believe perform better when they are watched. From the time you were an undergraduate at Brown University, where you were drawn to student activism, prisoner advocacy, philosophy, history, and political science, to the years at the Yale Law School when your courses in human rights were serially canceled three times, you have been shaping what was once called idealism into a mobilization of investigative reporting, technology, knowledge of the law, and impact on public policy into a powerful and increasingly international defense of human rights. The organization you have led for the majority of its 30 years, Human Rights Watch, is today the world's most respected watchdog organization dedicated to, quote, holding oppressors accountable to their population, to the international community, and to their obligations under international law striving always for the greatest possible factual accuracy in the reports produced by Human Rights Watch without taking political sides. You mobilize public outrage, using the press to expose systematic human rights abuses and exerting pressure on our policymakers and government officials. And you have left no stone unturned, no government outside the law in your exposure of tyranny even when such witness leads to controversy. The New Republic, even when critical, conceded that the organization you have shaped and grown exponentially with the help of a major gift from George Soros is, quote, widely considered the gold standard in human rights reporting, an organization whose conclusions nobody can afford to ignore. Scrupulously fair in assessing facts and crimes in light of the Geneva Conventions, you have recently called out both ISIS and Assad, as well as Russian intervention in Syria for the continuing oppression and destruction of ordinary Syrian civilians and communities. On immigration, you point to the facts, the real comparative numbers of refugees as against the population of Europe to challenge myths and fears of a so-called crisis focusing always on the rights of those who cannot defend their own. We at the American University of Paris acknowledge with honor, Ken Roth, your principled lifelong commitment to defending the oppressed, the silenced, the disappeared, and the feared. Speaking always for their humanity, you restore our own. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of the American University of Paris, and with the recommendation of the faculty voting in assembly, I confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining. As you accept this degree in hood, we welcome you to the American University of Paris community. Thank you very much. And now, Ken Roth will give the commencement address. Well, thank you very much for this honor. But really, what I'd like to do is begin by congratulating all of you on, on this huge accomplishment. Um, this is obviously a wonderful moment. It, it's one to savor with, with your family and friends for all the hard work that went into your AUP degree. Now, as you think back, on what it took to reach this day. You're probably going to think about the courses you took, the lectures and seminars you attended, the papers and exams you completed, the grades you received. Your graduation today is a moment to celebrate these formal requirements for a degree. But there are also many intangibles of a university degree. And I suspect that they're going to turn out to be the most important legacy of your time at AUP. 
the ability to think, analyze, write, communicate, even imagine. These are the lasting results of your education. In all likelihood, they are going to matter far more for you than the courses you completed or even the diploma that you received today. Now, among these intangibles is a set of values. Your time at AUP has helped to shape a moral framework for seeing your fellow students, your community, and your place in the world. Your education, if it's worked as it should, has taught you to see the humanity in each individual, to respect and value differences, to treat others with the respect that you would want them to accord you. These are the building blocks of a liberal society. They are the foundation of what variously might be called the Enlightenment, or democracy, or human rights. I have spent my career upholding those values. For 23 years, I have led the Human Rights Watch defense of those values. So it is with real consternation that I report that these values are under attack today more intensely than at any period I can recall in my lifetime. Now, I realize that that's quite a statement. After all, I spend my time investigating, documenting, exposing, and trying to change the conduct of governments and others that violate human rights. I deal with atrocities and horrible abuse. But what I'm seeing today is not only violations of human rights, awful as those can be, but also a deliberate attack on the values of human rights themselves. We're seeing it here in Europe, where leaders like Hungary's Viktor Orban or Poland's Jarosław Kaczynski speak openly of building an illiberal democracy, one that doesn't need human rights. In country after country, we're seeing the rise of far-right parties and even mainstream parties that trade in intolerance, xenophobia, nativism, and fear-mongering. Now, this is not exclusively a European phenomenon. We see it as well in American demagogues who advance their political prospects by appealing to our worst instincts. We see it in China and Russia's promotion of authoritarian government as a supposedly superior model. In African leaders' attacks on international justice because prosecutors have targeted their mass atrocities. In the growing number of governments around the world trying to keep citizens from banding together to make themselves heard, or most dramatically, as, as President Schenk just mentioned, in the Syrian government's decision to rip up the Geneva Conventions and fight a war by deliberately attacking civilians in areas held by the opposition. But because we're here in the heart of Europe, I'd like to focus on what's happening here. We have all witnessed the rising Islamophobia, the tarring and marginalizing of entire communities, the demonizing of refugees, the efforts to turn back the clock to a time when society was thought to be more uniform, less a melding of differences. The causes of this rising intolerance are easy enough to discern. These are times of economic insecurity, when many feel that they're falling behind. These are times of physical insecurity, when people enjoying a night out with friends in a Paris cafe or concert hall are randomly shot down. And these are times of cultural insecurity, when the meaning of what it is to be French or Belgian or German is no longer as simple as had long been assumed. In such times of insecurity, there is a tendency to retrench, to seek shelter among those who seem most like you, to shut the gates to others. That instinct provides the platform for the growing voices of hate. My plea to you today, as you graduate into the world, is to accept responsibility for countering these assaults on the values that were a central part of your university education. There are dangerous developments around you. They put in question the very nature of the societies in which you will build your lives. 
I urge you to reject this movement toward hate, exclusion, and intolerance, and to do your part to reverse it. Now, you might ask, how am I going to do that? These are big trends. I'm just one person. How can I make a difference? If you all do your part, the task is not as daunting as you might think. To begin with, use your university education to cut through the myths and misrepresentations that often accompany the case for intolerance. Consider the public discourse these days about certain banlieues or quartier populaire of, par of Paris. France has clearly done a poor job of integrating its immigrants and their descendants, particularly many Muslims. We know the residents of these communities face limited job and educational opportunities, discriminatory encounters with the police, a sense of not really being accepted by French society. Now, most do the best they can under the circumstances, but some small minority is radicalized and turns to violence. This is a serious problem, but is Islamophobia really the answer? These communities are here to stay. If we do not enable their residents to build meaningful lives, if we continue to frustrate their aspirations, their alienation and despair will only grow. Or take the problem of terrorism. It's true that today's terrorist threat in Europe comes mainly from second and third generation Muslim immigrants. A smart counterterrorism strategy reaches out to the people who are most likely to learn of a terrorist plot before it unfolds. The plotter's family, neighbors, and associates, many of them also Muslim. We want them to feel comfortable reporting suspicious activity to the police. We want them to feel part of the solution rather than the problem. But Islamophobia does the opposite. People who feel that they cannot trust the police, that they themselves will regard, be regarded with suspicion if they share their concerns, will remain silent. Or let's look at the refugees. My wife, who is here today, is a medical doctor who regularly teaches Syrian doctors. So she and I have spent together quite a bit of time on the Syrian border. We have seen the desperate need of people who are fleeing Assad's barrel bombs and the Islamic State atrocities. They're people in urgent need of our help. Now, none of us wants to see chaos at the borders of Europe, but we should be encouraging our governments to help these people by giving generous funding to enable them to build their lives in the countries of first refuge in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, should they choose to do that. And for those who still want to seek a haven in Europe, we should be urging acceptance of many more people directly from those countries of first refuge without requiring them first to take a dangerous rickety boat across the Mediterranean. Now, you may or may not agree with each of these arguments, but there are many more to be made to counter the voices of hatred and intolerance. Use your university education to come up with the best arguments that you can. Don't assume that rising intolerance is inevitable. Don't assume that hatred is a natural product of challenging times. These sentiments flourish only when they are uncontested. Do your part to stem their flow. But of course, that leaves the question, how will you be heard? Let me ask you to begin by paying attention to how you conduct yourselves. Treat others the way you would want to be treated, the way you would want them to treat you. Be a model that others will emulate. Positive examples can be contagious. They speak loudly. You should also talk with your friends, your family, your communities. The more conversations, the better. Remember, populists love to say that they speak for the community, that they are the authentic voice of the people, that they are upholding national values from foreign intrusion. Your voice provides an important retort. You can say, no, these people do not speak for me. 
In addition, today you have the opportunity to take part in the broader public debate about the direction of Europe and the world. Unlike your peers of only a few classes earlier, you have grown up in the age of social media. Tools like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, WhatsApp, and many others have greatly democratized access to the public debate. To make your voices heard, you no longer must depend on often difficult access to the traditional media. You are all capable of entering the public conversation from your very own laptop or mobile phone. Use that megaphone. Seize the opportunity. Remember, every political movement starts locally. Every community begins with a circle of friends. When you're chatting with your friends or family, when you're engaging online, find space to include commentary on the latest assault on your values. Figure out the ways to advance the conversation. The more you join it, the more comfortable you will feel and the more significant your voice will become. Even if you start with just a few people, there's a ripple effect. If all of you graduating today do your part, the ripples can become waves, even tides. The enduring significance of your AUP education is in large part the values it has instilled. If you want to a world built around those values, you cannot take them for granted. There is an urgent need for all of us to come to their defense. Please do your part.